super time us doing this. So let's see how it goes. If anybody the way I started is um I didn't know you could even be paid to be a public speaker and everything. Uh so like the, the guy that was running the like this initially I, when I joined my company was called Telerik. And the guy that was running the London office, like he knew me through a friend of mine and like he contacted me and he explained me that you know people like to you know listen to people about like technology and everything and like he knew that like uh, I, I, I had like an outgoing personality so he kind of convinced me that like it's something that i might enjoy doing um but in general like uh, i think like that, uh, i mean for me this was like a perfect thing like literally somebody came in and said like hey i'm willing to pay you to do that but this is basically a very rare case um but my advice usually to people is like, if you want to do something similar, it's actually really good to um, go and start speaking at uh, various meetups and like basically cut your teeth. Uh, and it doesn't have something uh, super crazy, advanced and everything. Like we all have something interesting to talk about. And I always uh, kind of like see of like, uh, because the, usually the question is like, uh, what happens if uh, people won't be interested in what I want to talk about or like what if they don't like the topic. Uh, the idea is like you defer the responsibility to the organizers, right? If you write to Kirill and say, hey, Kirill, I think I could talk about this. And if he says it's a good idea and people don't like the idea, that's his problem, right? <laughs> it's not yours, right? <laughs> but but that's, how, that's how it works. And you would be surprised how um, some of like super simple talks uh, could be really well uh, received. So like I remember like two years ago, I wanted to give a quick talk at a, a London, uh, London JS meetups because I live in London. And I literally went with, hey, I'm going to talk to you about Angular CLI. That was my talk. Like every single one of you could give that talk. Uh, and I went there and I like built a very similar application, like just like Jason was doing, but like a lot simpler, just like sing uh, single workspace. Uh, and then people loved it. Uh, so yeah, be brave. Like uh, uh, don't be afraid. And also... If you ever like watch people speak and you could and you say like oh I really love this guy's style I, or this or this woman like they're absolutely amazing I wanna do exactly like that like don't try to copy people like be yourself so if your style is that you come in and throw a lot of jokes uh, like Shai Resnick and this is how you are yeah be like Shai Resnick but if you're more of like a quiet person and you just say okay I have point A B C to make and I think this is interesting I want to show you this. Do that. Just be yourself. That's kind of the idea. That's a bit yeah. of a long answer, but yeah. That's how you get a job in dev now. <laughs> so for me, I um, I get presented during school. It's part of this program called like Entrepreneur something, something, something. It doesn't really matter. Basically, what we had to do was pitch our startup ideas to alumni. So I figured it was pretty important to learn how to present well, so that's what I started presenting. I stopped for a while when I started working, but uh, Stephen Fluin, the uh, Angular DevRel, he contacted me and said, hey, do you want to talk about what your company is doing in Angular Connect? I was like, yeah, how can I pass up the opportunity? So my first time speaking like professionally, I guess, was getting up on stage in front of like a thousand people. Um, but it, it wasn't that scary, really. Like I rehearsed my talk beforehand, I made it months in advance, and it went smoothly. People loved it. And I think that's the best thing about presenting is that you get to share your ideas with other people and they really appreciate it and you get to share your knowledge. Cool. Uh, the next question is, what is your favorite book about programming? Um, so actually, yeah, there's a whole ton of them, but like I, I thought that one book that is quite generic and is applicable to any type of languages or frameworks that you use is, uh, is uh, Clean Code, uh, which I really, really like, and uh, pretty much everybody should read it. I would never say that you should follow every single rule there, like uh, like, a, like some people would follow Bible, uh, but just like take it as a common sense, like uh, read through it and see what works for you, what doesn't, uh, and, and, and it's pretty cool. Like I remember when I read this book and I was uh, still working my previous company, and I said like, I wanna stop adding comments to my code, and like people almost like tried to almost uh, kill me or like try to kick me out of the office. Uh, so like I have to back down on that one. But there's a lot of other really cool ideas. So I definitely um, recommend. One of my favorites is uh, algorithms to live by. So algorithms, if you come from a boot camp or something, 
where you're like not formally educated like I am, um, they can be a bit intimidating. But the truth is that a lot of algorithms we actually use in real life. So this book doesn't talk about code really. Um, it talks about how your real life world is com comprised of algorithms. So one of the first ones is kind of like an interview process. So your company is looking for their next worker and stuff like that. But how long do you really interview for? Um, one of the algorithms out there is that if you don't know how long something could take to find the result, is that you set a quota. You say, all right, go through like a thousand objects. Mathematically, you go through at least 37% of them. And then you find the next one that's better than all of those other 37%. And this applies to like interviewing. If you're interviewing for position, you say, I want to interview 10 candidates. Interview three. Next one that's better than them, take them. It could be the fourth one, it could be the seventh one, but once you find someone better, take it. That's just one of the examples, but it goes through a lot of different algorithms and explains it in that fashion. Uh, the next question is, what advice would you give to junior devs? It's kind of like, can be anything, so uh, keep it short, basically. Okay, short answer. Um, so some of the, like, a lot of things, a lot of time people would think like, oh yeah, like just code more or do more projects or do something. Actually, my advice is try to learn to communicate. Like the communication within the team is, is something that uh, a lot of people like find it very difficult, especially in depth, but it's something that's ab absolutely crucial. So if you can uh, very like know when to step out and like uh, talk to your team and say, hey, I have this problem, this so-and-so is happening. It's actually gonna change the way you work with everybody. It's like, for me, this is one of the core uh, skills of a developer. Yeah, that's very similar. Um, find mentors or find people that will help you because most people will help you. Uh, like developers are like um, generalized to be kind of like heads down and they'll never talk to anybody else. But in reality, I've found that you can ask anybody a question and they'll try to answer it or they'll help you and like it'll pique their interest and they'll help solve it with you. So find help when you need help. But, but stay polite. Like if somebody, like people sometimes are busy. Like, you yeah. know, if you ping Jason like every, every, every hour, like eventually, you know, you might get tired or something or what if you are just busy, just stay patient and always be polite. Yeah, I personally ping like so many cool people with such silly questions and most of them like super nice and they would get back to me and respond. So I concur with this advice. Uh, continuation of the question, what would you advise, what advice would you give to senior devs? Hmm. Keep learning. Um, just because you're a senior dev doesn't mean you know everything. And like nobody knows everything. Um, people that write the languages you use like they're still learning people that are researchers in machine learning like the most complicated things i think they just keep learning and that's how they got where they are so don't stop yeah. and i also like find like one of the best ways to also keep growing as a senior developer or any any type of senior is actually like teach people who are junior or like uh, at the mid level uh, like don't don't look down at people like it's, see it as more of an opportunity to share uh, the knowledge that you have. And if the junior person that you were training one day surpasses you, that means that you actually were successful at it, right? It's like, that's pretty much the whole idea. Next one is very specific. What pathways are available to migrate from hybrid apps using Ionic slash Cordova to native? And that sounds like Sebastian's question. Yeah. Um, so if you if you like using a hybrid mobile development and be kind of tired of its limitations. Uh, we actually have a pretty cool uh, tutorial that like this website called uh, Hybrid to Native uh, that basically takes you step by step of how to take your, let's say, Ionic application and convert it into a native script app, uh, which basically you are going from a web view to having an actually native application with a native UI and all the capabilities that go with it. And, and I think like going through that uh, tutorial is probably one of the best thing. Uh, it's definitely more than a couple of hours of read, so it's very extensive. Uh, so it doesn't just like uh, cover the high level, it goes quite in depth as well. I, I like this question. How do you keep up, keep up with all new things which happen in the JavaScript world because there are like so many frameworks and yeah. 
Uh, so I watch a lot of YouTube videos and I watch them at like three times speed. So if you can learn how to do that, I would do that. Um, like I saves a lot of time you know, being able to speed up your videos and digest that information quickly, but like still get that information. I find that's the best way. And then I also read Twitter. I think a lot of cool devs are on Twitter, the products that you love, they're probably on Twitter. Um, so read Twitter and you'll hear from people that you know and people that you want to hear from. Yeah. Yeah, very, very similar. I think like to me is also going to meetups like this one or going to events and like uh, talking to experts in different fields. Uh, but I also have like a one piece of advice around this. Do not try to become an expert in all those fields. Like it's good to know like high level of pretty much everything, but then maybe dive into two or three different things, right? Don't try to dive in everything because basically you're going to be a jack of all trades and that might not come up very useful. Um, yeah. I've seen a lot of talks about native script. I have not used it myself. Um, and I'm an expert in what I know, and I know other people that are experts in what they know. So, well, like if you have to dive into something, you should dive in native script. Come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll do it over the weekend. Um, additional question What's one Twitter account uh, which people interested in Angular should follow, which is not at Angular and not at native script and not at Angular world? I would follow the, the guys from uh, Thoughtgram, maybe. I was there. Thoughtgram. Thoughtgram. Yeah. You know, like it's from Pascal Brecht. Oh, um, man. He's uh, from Startup. They also have Thoughtgram. That's how it's spelled. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I'll definitely follow that one. Uh -huh. Yeah. They, they write cool stuff as well. Okay, I, I think this one is not someone a lot of Angular devs will follow, but Dan Adamoff, which is uh, part of the React core team, he talks about a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff on his Twitter, and like he has a lot of opinions and all of that. So, and those are his opinions. You can follow them. You don't have to. I just find it interesting to read about them and what other people think. Do they just like follow them? So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Then I probably. Yeah, Dan is actually quite good. It's like um, he's very open as well to comments, and, and he is open to have a conversation with you about anything. Yeah, he's not gonna you know die and, and fight over every single comment. He's he's quite good in that sense. If we have uh, two more questions, unless somebody submitted their questions, uh, how do you not get burned out? That that you that, don't get burned out. <laughs> Well, actually, so burnout is like really, really hard because, uh, especially like in my case, like when it comes to dev roles, there's a lot of traveling, and like you always have to be at a hundred percent. So I think it's like avoiding burnout, it's almost like you have to plan ahead uh, for to have breaks, so you cannot be constantly working. You have to kind of like at least every quarter, or every six months, have like those two, three weeks of where you you keep going, but maybe you work at fifty percent. Uh, but you have to give yourself some breathing space. Like, don't compress your like every single day into working. You know, eight hours, twelve hours, or whatever. And by the way, it's actually okay to just work seven hours a day. Like, you don't have to kill yourself, because in the end, if you're productive during those seven hours, you're probably gonna get a lot more done than working twelve hours a day and being at fifty percent. Mine's sort of similar. Is um, try not to work outside of work. But uh, I do so anyway sometimes. Uh, it's just important to not do it every single night. So if you find an event that you like going to once a week, like that's a good way to do it. And the last one is kind of philosophical. What keeps your coding besides your job? Hmm. So that's actually one of the things, like to me, is like I rarely code nowadays outside of work just to avoid burnout. That's, that's kind of my thing. So uh, even like the way I, I work, like I, I work from home whenever I'm not traveling, so I have one room. Uh, and so I work there and the moment I'm done, like I do not re-enter the room. It's like until I come back the next day. Uh, so for me, it's actually, I do not code so much outside of work anymore, just to avoid burnout really. Uh, what keeps me coding uh, for like when I do code outside of work is an interesting problem. I think like anyone can relate 
if you have a problem and you can't really solve it or like you're halfway there, um, that that keeps me coding. Um, like things like working on NX are very interesting to me. I'm not only saying this because I gave a talk about NX, but it's some of the most fascinating work that I've done with coding. That's not like front end UI, like how do I organize my repo? It's more of like, how do I analyze an, a whole repo of like thousands of thousands of lines of code efficiently to show you the information that you want? So those kind of problems keep me coding. That's good work, right? It's open source, so I count it differently. Uh, if, it, if it's voluntary by me, then like it doesn't have to be an X, right? Like a good problem that's not part of work would still keep me keep me interested in coding. Cool. Uh, I think that's all questions we have. Thanks for this question, Jason. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.